Hello, you are watching Armando Hasurungan Biology and Medicine videos. Please make sure to subscribe, join the forum and group. For the latest videos, visit Facebook Armando Hasurungan, like, ask questions, answer questions, and post interesting things. Now, this series of videos is on human metabolism, and it won't go into too much detail about glycolysis, gluconeogenesis, beta oxidation, etc. It will just show you how they are all interconnected in some way. And also, there are some pictures, such as this glucose molecule, which is a six ringed carbon structure to help for visual learning. Let's begin this journey with glycolysis, and again, this won't go into detail. I will introduce the products of glycolysis first, then I will go back and introduce the enzyme and other cofactors, ATP, etc. Glucose converts to glucose 6 phosphate with the addition of a phosphate on the sixth carbon. Glucose 6 phosphate will then change its structure to form fructose 6 phosphate, exactly the same except it's a five ring structure still with the six carbons. Glucose 6-phosphate and fructose 6-phosphate are isomers of each other. This line with the two arrows indicate that the reaction can be reversed, whereas the reaction before can't be reversed without using a different enzyme. Fructose 6-phosphate will convert to fructose 1,6-bis-phosphate with an addition of a phosphate. So now there's a phosphate on the first and the sixth carbon, a phosphate off the first and sixth carbon. Fructose 1,6-bis-phosphate will then split in half to form two structures. One of them is called dihydroxyacetone phosphate, and the other one, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. Now, the difference between the two is that glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate is in an aldehyde form, with the oxygen coming off the end, a double bonded oxygen coming off the end. And the dihydroxyacetone, however, is in a ketone form, with a double bonded oxygen coming out in the middle. Now, in glycolysis, dihydroxyacetone phosphate will typically convert glyc to glycer uh, will typically convert glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate to continue glycolysis. But I'll show you this later on. So glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate will continue glycolysis and convert to 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate with an addition of a phosphate to the first carbon. 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate will then dephosphorylate to become 3-phosphoglycerate with the phosphate still remaining on the third carbon, but the phosphate off the first carbon has gone. So 3-phosphoglycerate will then convert to 2-phosphoglycerate. The phosphate off the third carbon has just changed positions and is now off the second carbon. So 2-phosphoglycerate will then de so 2-phosphoglycerate will then dehydrate, remove removal of a water to form Phosphoenol pyruvate. And fine, this is what phosphoenol pyruvate looks like. And then finally, phosphoenol pyruvate will dephosphorylate to become pyruvate. And dephosphorylation, the removal of the phosphate from this of the second carbon. Now pyruvate is the final product of glycolysis. So now let's go back and look at the enzymes and stuff. So glucose with the enzyme. So glucose with the enzyme hexokinase will get a phosphate group from ATP to form glucose 6-phosphate. And this reaction is irreversible, cannot be reversed unless with a different enzyme. Glucose 6-phosphate then with the enzyme phosphohexose isomerase will change shape to fructose 6-phosphate, which is an isomer of glucose 6-phosphate. This reaction is reversible. Fructose 6-phosphate with the enzyme phosphofructokinase will get a phosphate from ATP again and form fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. Now this reaction is reversible. Then fructose 1,6-bisphosphate will split in half with the enzyme aldolase to form glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate and dihydroxyacetone phosphate. This reaction is reversible. Dihydroxyacetone phosphate and glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate can convert back to each other with the enzyme triose phosphate isomerase because both these molecules are isomers of each other. However, in glycolysis, dihydroxyacetone phosphate will usually convert to glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate to continue glycolysis. So there are two glyceraldehyde 3-phosphates now in glycolysis, but for simplicity, I will only pretend there is only one. So, one glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate with the enzyme glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase will convert to 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate, the phosphate coming from inorganic phosphate. And also in this reaction, hydrogen was removed by NAD to form NADH. 
1,3-bisphosphoglycerate with the enzyme 3-phosphoglycerate kinase will dephosphorylate the phosphate from the first carbon by transferring it to ADP, making 3-phosphoglycerate. 3-phosphoglycerate then, with the enzyme phosphoglycerate mutase, will form 2-phosphoglycerate. The phosphate is only in a different location now. It is off the second carbon. 2 phosphoglycerate with will dehydrate, remove water, to form phosphoenolpyruvate by the enzyme enolase. And finally, phosphoenolpyruvate will dephosphorylate by the enzyme pyruvate kinase to form pyruvate. The phosphate is transferred to ADP forming ATP. Pyruvate is the final product of glycolysis, from glucose all the way to two pyruvate molecules. Pyruvate looks something like this. Now glycolysis is a 10 reaction process to provide quick energy in the forms of ATP. So glycolysis is to provide quick energy such as when running, like this, or sprinting. Remember that 2 ATP was invested or used until fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. Then, from two glyceraldehyde 3-phosphates, four ATP was produced in total, giving a net of two ATP, a gain, a net gain of two ATP. Now, the two pyruvates then have a number of fates from glycolysis. In anaerobic conditions or without oxygen, it can form, it can form, it can enter two things and become two things, one of which two pyruvates can become two ethanols and carbon dioxide, and two carbon dioxides, and this is during alcohol fermentation to make wine or whatnot. Or alternatively, the two pyruvates can produce two lactates, which is a byproduct of muscle when using glycolysis for energy, and occurs when exercising vigorously. Alternatively, the two pyruvates can become amino acids such as alanine, which has a very similar structure to pyruvate, but mostly in a metabolic environment during aerobic conditions with oxygen. When the body needs more energy, pyruvate will enter the mitochondria and convert to acetyl-CoA. Now acetyl-CoA can then enter the citric acid cycle, also known as a Krebs cycle, to synthesize more ATP. So the mitochondria here consists of two separate membranes, the outer membrane and the inner membrane. Pyruvate enters the mitochondria through the pyruvate transporter, through the outer membrane and the inner membrane. So pyruvate is now inside the mitochondria. And pyruvate will then convert to acetyl-CoA, releasing carbon dioxide, CO2, with a pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, the enzyme. Now it's a large complex because it consists of three enzyme, enzymes, thiamine pyrophosphate or TPP, lipoate or lipoamide, and FAD, which is one of those uh, electron carriers. Now, acetyl-CoA is an important metabolite and interconnects with almost everything. It is also important in fatty acid synthesis, which we will look at later on. But typically, acetyl-CoA will enter the Krebs cycle. And we won't go into Krebs cycle during these videos. We'll, later on, we will probably. But for now, we will stop there, and next we will review gluconeogenesis as well as glycogen synthesis. Thank you for watching. Please comment, subscribe, like, and tell me if I'm talking too fast, please. Thank you.